is there a way to reset that financial set point? We said, let's just help you rewire your brain to a new financial setting. Over six months, we increased sales more than the previous six months by $100 million. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Money Mondays. We have a very special episode because I have a very special person here that I've been very close with, I've looked up to for many, many years. Sometimes we live close, sometimes we live far, but we always meet up wherever we can, when we can. And so it's been wa- amazing to watch his journey. I've been watching him on movies, reading his books, seeing him at events, masterminds. He throws his own masterminds, he throws his own events. He teaches people all over the world about their brain and the inner workings of what goes inside of the human mind. And so without further ado, wherever you are on the planet, give a round of applause to Mr. John Asraf. And the crowd goes <laughs> Hey, Dan. All right, so as you guys know, this podcast will be under 40 minutes because the average workout is 45 minutes. The average commute to work is 45 minutes. So this episode will be under 40 minutes for your viewing or listening pleasure, wherever you are. Make sure to check us out on themoneymondays.com. We have been sticking at that number one, number two, number three spot for the last 66 weeks in a row. And it's all thanks to you guys by subscribing, commenting, liking, sharing, doing all those things. As you know, I don't run any ads here. We spend 70,000 a month to keep this thing running free for you guys so that I don't run ads. Maybe at some point I'll take on one big deal or one big sponsor, but I don't wanna sit here and read commercials to you guys because I wanna get right to the point. And with that being said, I'm gonna have John Asraf do a quick two minute bio so we can get straight to the money. All right, bio, Um, an entrepreneur, just like many of you that are listening right now, uh, failed English, failed math, left high school, grade 11, didn't feel like I was smart enough, good enough, worthy enough to succeed until I got a mentor. And somebody asked me, what do I want to achieve in my life? And I said, well, I'd like to get a job that pays more than a buck sixty-five an hour. I'd like to move out of my parents' home and I'd love to buy my own car. And this guy said, this is great, but what do you really want to achieve? And so he gave me some documents to look at and asked me what age do I want to retire? How much money do I want to have? Where do I want to travel? Who do I want to help? What kind of a difference do I want to make in the world? And I wrote out a whole bunch of stuff on these documents that he gave me. And this was 43 years ago. And then he asked me one question and the question changed my life. He said, are you interested in achieving all of these things? Or young man, are you committed to achieving them? And when I asked him, what's the difference? He said, well, if you're interested, you'll do what's convenient and easy. And you'll come up with stories and reasons and excuses why you can't. But when you are committed, you will upgrade your identity and you'll upgrade your beliefs and your habits and your knowledge and your skills. And you'll do whatever it takes to achieve those goals. So I said he was committed, uh, that I was committed. And then he became my mentor. And then I've built a couple companies, one to four and a half billion a year in sales, written New York Times bestselling books. Been in 15 movies right now, traveled all over the world sharing and caring and um, having great life experiences and now sharing what I can with as many people as I can. So there's two minutes and <laughs> under. <laughs> yeah. All right. So the main three topics we talk about here on the Money Mondays is how to make money, how to invest money, how to give it away to charity. So let's talk about the making money side. What do you think holds most people back from making money? Great. So um, I'm going to give you two different answers. So I'm going to give you the inner game stuff, the stuff that's happening in people's heads. But I'm going to give you the practical behavioral stuff that people make an error in. So number one, there's only four things that hold people back from making money. But before we even go there, the question is, is there more than enough money in the world? And I think, you know, there's more than enough money. There's trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars and wealth. So the question then becomes... Do you understand what money is? And money, number one, is a means of exchange. So tribes exchanged, you know, seashells, uh, uh, livestock, uh, eggs, fish, meat, berries. We use it as a means of exchange. So that's part one is understanding what is money. Nothing more than a means of exchange. But there's only four things that hold people back. Either they have a fear of going after what they want. They have a self-image that prevents them from going after what they want. They have limiting beliefs that hold them back from going after they want, or they lack the knowledge and skill of what to do, which causes self-doubt and uncertainty and fear, which means they won't take action. Part one. Part two, most people have no idea what their highest income producing activities are. 
And if most people looked at their calendar and they said, okay, in any 50 hour week, how many hours did you spend, let's say, earning money, making money? Now, if you have a job, your boss has taken the risk or your owner of a company is taking the risk, they pay you an hourly fee to trade your knowledge, skill, whatever the case is. But if you're an entrepreneur and you don't know what your highest income producing activity is per hour, then you are changing or exchanging your time for everything that seems to be worth the same amount per hour. So first you need to know what is your highest income producing activity. Second, you need to know what is the highest impact producing activities that get you to the point of being able to exchange your time, knowledge, skill, program, product, or service for money. Most people have no idea of A, how to get rid of the four internal obstacles, and then they don't understand what time is worth and how to get themselves to the point where they are making a lot of money for time. Obvious question that we all want to know, what are the four internal obstacles? Well, the four internal obstacles is as self-image, mm -hmm. right? So we will never outperform our hidden self-image. So we have a, a self-image on, well, I'm worth X in the marketplace based on my knowledge, my skill, or lack thereof, based on how old I am, young or old, based on my um, education, based on my experience, I should earn X amount. And the question is, where did you get that belief? <laughs> yeah. Right? A belief will drive your perspective of what you see, but a belief will also drive your behavior. But a belief also sets up what you expect. So here's my question. Was anybody, anybody that's listening or watching, anybody that's ever walked on earth, 107 billion humans have walked on earth, was any one human ever born with a single belief? Zero. What about fear? Fear of failing, fear of being embarrassed, fear of being ashamed, fear of being ridiculed, fear of being judged, fear of disappointing yourself or somebody else, fear of being ridiculed, fear of being abandoned, fear of being unloved. So fear holds people back. What if I try my best and I fail and you see me and then you go, ha, 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 you failed like somebody may have done to you at school. So fear holds us back because fear deactivates the motivational circuit in the brain. So we have self-image. We will never outperform what we believe we are worth. We have fear that holds us back because we are in a protective mode most of the time. Avoidance of pain, discomfort, whether it's real or imagined. And then we have limiting beliefs. But we weren't born with any of these things. So we have a limiting belief of I can only earn X amount because my husband, my wife, my education, we have these constructs. And by the way, all of these are nothing more from a neuroscience perspective than neural patterns in the brain that have been reinforced. And the great news is, is we can deactivate limiting beliefs and replace them with empowering beliefs mm -hmm. deliberately. We can learn how to manage this thing called fear because it's just an emotion that is triggering neurochemicals into your bloodstream that causes behavior, whether you take action or don't. And then self-image is nothing more than a reinforced image of yourself in your own mind. And if you have been traumatized, if you have uh, failed, if you have been embarrassed or ashamed when you've tried your best and didn't achieve what you wanted to, um, then you move into a protective mechanism so you don't have to experience this emotion, okay, of being embarrassed, ashamed, ridiculed, judged, or disappointed. So we move, we move away from what we don't want. And then the fourth one is you lack the knowledge or the skill of actually how to do it. And when we lack the knowledge and skill of well, what should I do? When should I do it? How should I do it? How do I mitigate my risk? Then guess what our brain does? Well, since you don't know, I'm going to activate the doubt circuit. In the doubt circuit, I'm in a protective mode because I don't want to be embarrassed, ashamed, ridiculed, or judged, <laughs> or rejected, or fail because I don't like that feeling. So we move away from these feelings that we haven't learned how to manage and then control so they control us. So we've seen this happen before where someone is making money and at some point they hit a plateau or it's a self-inflicted plateau because they don't feel like they deserve yeah. or they can't earn anymore. And sometimes they surpass it and make a bunch of money and lose it on purpose. Lose it. Well, it's not necessarily on purpose. So I, I call that the lottery winner syndrome. So when somebody wins the lottery, you know, 5 million, 10 million, 20 million, 50 million. Um, the average, the number is about 87% lose it within five years. 87%. And the question is why? Well, are you also aware that about 87% of, let's say, people that 
are homeless and feel comfortable on the street, uh, barring, let's say, mental illness, if you put them in nice housing, they ruin the housing and they go back to the street because mm -hmm. they're comfortable in the street. Mm -hmm. Many years ago, when I was building Remax of Indiana, um, we had reached 1.2 billion in sales a year. Um, and we were like the number one real estate company in the state of Indiana. And I was wondering, how come we're doing a lot of training? We're giving them books. We have the best speakers in the world that, that train, whether it was uh, Dennis Waitley, Brian Tracy, Zig Ziglar, all the greats back then. And uh, everybody said, oh my God, I'm going to do so well. And they would do really well for a week or two. And then they would revert back to all of their old behaviors because we would watch their, their sales. And it dawned on me that um, based on Maxwell Maltz's book many, many years ago called Psycho-Cybernetics, um, uh, cybernetics is the control and response mechanism that happens in machines like a thermostat. If there's too much air uh, or cold air in a room, um, the heat may come on. If it's too hot in room, the air may come on. That's a cybernetic mechanism. So whatever the setting is controls the temperature. Well, Maxwell Maltz discovered that we have something known as a psycho-cybernetic mechanism. Uh, we have, for example, everybody has a fat set point. The amount of fat that you are used to carrying on your body. And if you go up or down from that set point, you either eat more or eat less. And you maintain that set point. Well, in having over 1,200 salespeople working you know, with me in Remax, we discovered that we have financial set points too. So if, let's say, our agents would do really, really, really well one month because we were, we were motivating them and inspiring them or we had a contest, we would see a drop the very next month until there was a baseline of what they did previously. It's like dawned on me. Hmm. Oh, my God. Is there a way to reset that financial set point? So I did a little test. I took 75 of those agents. This is going back a few years. And we took 75 of those agents. We saw what they sold in the previous six months and we did a baseline average and we said listen we're not going to teach you any more skills around selling better like how do you close sales how do you get more listings how do you make more sales none of that we said let's just help you rewire your brain to a new financial setting and we did um, visualizations. We did uh, mindfulness training so they were aware of their thoughts and their behaviors. Uh, we did cognitive behavior techniques to change their daily habits and routines over a 100-day uh, period of time, then another 100 days. Uh, we did affirmations uh, that we recorded and had them listen to. And the average person, over six months, we increased sales more than the previous six months by 100 million dollars 100 million extra in sales no training on selling more only on resetting their own self-image and financial set point now when i was this is going back a long time 19 i was making a dollar 65 an hour working in the shipping department okay of phillips electronics the big electronics company mm -hmm. and i was in the shipping department and i've freaking hated it. And my first mentor, his name was Alan Brown. He said, well, what's your goal? I said, well, like I, I want to get a nice house and a nice car and I want to have all this stuff that he had me write out on this document. He says, well, you're going to need about $10,000 a month. Whoa. Okay. This, by the way, is Back then, yeah. before you were born. This was May, oh, sorry, June of 1980 to put into perspective. I'm yeah. 62 now. It was June of 1980. And so every day I would look at my goals and I would, I, would, I would visualize that I was living in this nice home, that I had this nice car, that $10,000 was coming into my bank account. And when I would read it, because this is how you prime your brain, you read it, you listen to it, you close your eyes, you feel it, you, 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 you mentally rehearse. I used to hear this voice in my head that says, that's bullshit, you're not making 10 grand a month. Um, now, within, three, within six months, I made $30,000. Not bad, right? Not bad for a dollar sixty-five an hour. Seriously. But the next twelve months, I made a hundred and fifty-one thousand dollars. Now, did I learn? <laughs> did I learn selling techniques? Yes, but I wasn't learning selling techniques and marketing techniques to make the money. It was because I was seeing myself achieving the vision, the goals, feeling it, that I developed the skills to match the new identity and the new reality I was creating. And since then, I've studied 
the neuroscience reasons behind it, the quantum physics side behind it. And I was developing the new reality before it existed in my mind, in my heart, in my, in my, in my being. And then of course, you know, I asked myself, well, in order to earn, let's say $10,000, you know, um, a month, which was, my father was making $2,000 a month at the time, right. just to put into perspective. In order to earn that, uh, what would I need to believe? And I said, well, I would need to believe that I'm smart enough. Now, remember, I failed English, failed math, left high school to grade 11, didn't feel smart enough, didn't feel good enough, didn't feel like success was for me. So I wrote down, well, um, I am uh, so happy and grateful for the fact that I am more than smart enough to earn $10,000 a, a month. I am so happy and grateful that I have all the skills and knowledge and abilities to earn $10,000 a month. I am so happy and grateful for the fact that I am a professional real estate agent. I didn't even know anything about real estate when I was reading these things. But I took what I was reading, then I recorded them on cassette tapes. Hmm. And then I would listen to this stuff while I was driving. And I started to feel more confident. I started to feel more certain. I started to actually start to believe and I call this, interestingly enough, in what I teach today, I call this the Hollywood effect. And let me explain. Imagine you get a new script, um, and let's say Steven Spielberg or, or, or um, um, a Hollywood actor, actress that you love, sees you in a restaurant and, and says to you, hey, uh, I just finished reading the script. Uh, there's a part in here that I think you could play the role, and, and I know you've probably never acted before, but if they gave you that five-minute script, and you had to memorize it and and be the role you've never seen it before you've never acted and what would you do to be the role everything anything well like what would, would you read it I'd study it inside out so you'd study it inside out so you take something that's not real a fictitious character mm -hmm. fictitious scenario fictitious everything mm -hmm. and you would read it once five times ten times fifty times a hundred times Absolutely. you might practice it mm -hmm. you might um, now you might film yourself and see how good you're doing and then and then change what you're all doing yeah. you would do all of it you mm -hmm. you'd write mm -hmm. it you read it mm -hmm. you'd listen to it you'd affirm it you'd practice it and there would come a point where what you were reading that wasn't true what how you were acting that didn't feel comfortable all of a sudden start to feel a little bit more comfortable and here's why. Because practice makes permanent patterns in the brain. Whenever we're, let's say, using an affirmation or visualization or a mindfulness technique or any one of the methodologies, um, we're using a part of the brain called the hippocampus and the amygdala, the emotional response part of the brain. So the hippocampus is short-term memory. Read it once, say it once, do it once, three times, five times. It's like, okay, great, you're doing once or five times or ten times. But there comes a point that as soon as you start to do spaced repetition, uh, whether you visualize or meditate or mindfulness or mental contrast or any of the techniques, there comes a point where it moves from one part of the brain called the hippocampus into the part of the brain called the cerebellum. Now the cerebellum starts to create habits and habits in the brain are what? Automatic. So all of a sudden you can sing the song, you can read the script, you can recite you know, the thing that you affirm let's say is a new belief. You didn't believe it before, but now it's part of your subconscious conditioning. Now you start to believe it, and now you start to behave in ways with what you believe. Mm -hmm. That's the consistency that the brain has to create. So when the outside world of results does not match your internal map of reality, your beliefs, your self-image, your identity, your self-worth, your self-esteem, it auto-corrects. And that's why people do better you know, then they, they, they sabotage or they don't do as well and they're used to a higher level of performance to go, holy shit, I better get my ass in gear. And then they reach that baseline. So whenever you want to get to that next level, practice the next level in advance mm. for one month, two months, three months, four months, so that when you get there, your brain doesn't automatically kick you out by procrastination and self-sabotage. It's the exact same reason why 98% of people who go on a diet, lose weight, gain it back, and then some. That's called the yo-yo syndrome. On the investing side of our topics, I want to talk about investing to yourself. Yeah. It's not talking about investments. It's about sure. investing to yourself. Why should someone hire a mentor? Or go to a mastermind or research and read books. Yeah, listen... Um, I've invested over a million dollars of cash, I mean money, over 40 years on coaches, mentors, programs, books, whatever, over a million bucks. 
And the question is like, why should I do that? Well, think of shortcuts, right? Think of shortcuts. If somebody can share with you a path that is faster, easier, and smarter to get you from where you are to where you want to be, why go through the heavy lifting, learning, pain, discomfort um, of doing that? Uh -uh. So a mentor, a mastermind that expands your thinking, shows you the way, prevents you from doing certain things because they've seen the pattern over and over and over again. It's a way to be smarter. It's a way to save yourself money, time, headache, uh, confusion, overwhelm. It's For me, it's like I still have coaches and mentors. Mm -hmm. I still have them. I still pay for them. And the reason is because... I am limited even with my knowledge and how the brain works. And so they're able to, to show me perspective that I may not have. And if somebody, like, I don't think you should hire somebody uh, as a coach or mentor that hasn't done or isn't doing what you want to already achieve. Right. So don't hire somebody who was successful 35 years ago because times have changed. So if you want to hire a mentor, you know, make sure that they're relevant now. In that, in that category. Well, in that category, that in, 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 that, in, in yeah. that thing. Um, and, um, and so if you think about this, when, when you're investing money, when you pay, you pay attention. Mm -hmm. And if you respect the person that you're learning from and they could lay down the foundation for you, one of the things we talked about earlier that holds most people back is lack of knowledge and skill. Well, a mentor usually has the knowledge and skill from the failures that they've experienced and the successes they've had from the environment and the people that they're hanging around with. And they could just say, yeah, do this and don't do that. Like, how much is that worth? Like, think about um, why do you go to uh, get an MRI? Like if you have a shoulder pain or a hip pain or back pain, because you get a deeper look of what's happening, let's say at the at the tissue or, or the the bone level, x-ray bone, but if you want to get into the tissue, muscles, et cetera, you're going more into an MRI. But then if you give an MRI to an average person, they're going to go, what the F is this? Mm -hmm. I had no idea how to read this. Mm -hmm. But a radiologist goes, oh, well, there's a, there's a, a, a lesion over here, there's a tear over here, right. there's this over here, and they do that in seconds. So you could be looking at the exact same thing, and if you're not experienced, you have no freaking idea what you're looking sure. at. An expert, a mentor, will go, oh, yeah, um, there's a problem here, problem here, problem here. These things are fine. Um, do these three things. Done. So I'm going to give you guys a real-life example of what John just explained. When he said the word shortcuts, imagine that I want to start a clothing line, and John wants to start a clothing line. I am going to go do it by myself, and John is going to go hire Damon John. And Damon John has done $2 billion of clothing sales. So when I want to go do it, I'm going to Google search clothing manufacturer, clothing designer, clothing this, warehouse. How much does it cost to ship clothing? How much should I hire someone to do clothing for me? What is a tech pack? Who is a tech pack designer? And John, while I'm researching and cold calling and emailing and trying to figure out who to go hire if they even respond to me. Damon John's like, doo, 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 whistling. Okay, text the tech pack designer, text my manufacturer, text the warehouse. Okay. Oh, you need a merchant account? You're gonna need a merchant account. Dan didn't even bring up merchant accounts because Dan didn't know. Yeah. Damon did. Oh yeah, my buyer from Macy's, he'll definitely take the, this clothing line. John hasn't even started the clothing line. He's already texting Macy's and Nordstrom's and this company and that company and that company. Access. Well, Damon's yeah. lived it for 20 that's or 30 right. years. That's not just shortcuts. That's, <laughs> He's skipping the whole game. Yes, yeah, that's an exponential return. Yeah, exponential return. John could spend 50 grand, 100 grand to hire Damon John and go do 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 million dollars in sales while I'm still on Google yeah. <laughs> clicking buttons. And you don't even out. know what you don't know. For sure. And I'm right. going to waste yeah. six figures figuring it out. That's right. At least. <laughs> At least. <laughs> when I was in the franchising world for many, many years, you know, uh, we'd we'd have people that would say, well, why, why should I spend twenty five or fifty thousand dollars for a franchise? I said, well, what do you think it took to get all the processes and systems to perfection? Mm -hmm. um, millions of dollars. Yeah. So you think you're gonna create the processes, the systems for every area of your business or your life, right? By figuring it out on your own, you're going to spend years and tens of thousands of dollars, mistakes that you can't even think of that you're going to make, 
And the franchise says, here's the package. Step one, do this. Mm -hmm. Step two, do this. Step three, mm -hmm. do this. And then in your particular case with the mentor, it's the mentor already has the access as well. So, and they'll open the doors for you. So when someone finally makes a decision, I'm going to hire a mentor, yeah. right? I'm going to hire John Asraf. Here's hundreds of thousands of dollars. John, will you coach me? What is it after that, let's call it one year, for people to keep it going for yeah. the rest of their life? Well, first and foremost, um, before I'll take on a private client, and I usually work with 10 or 12 people, um, they have to answer the question. First, they've got to tell me, what's your vision? What do you want to achieve? And I have to make sure that I can help them. Um, but then the question is, are you interested or are you committed to achieving that? Mm -hmm. If they say I'm interested, I can't take them on as a client because they're not going to do whatever it takes to achieve right. that. And achieving goals is very, very different than setting goals. Setting goals, everybody can do. Achieving goals requires a process and following a process. Um, and for that, by the way, you need the STTTR process. It's strategies, tactics, timelines, tools, and resources. We'll leave that aside for now. Um, First and foremost, you know, um, there has to be a foundation set for the mindset. So when I work with any client now, based on what I know about the mindset, um, I work with creating what I call our customized inner sizes for them, for their self-image, their self-worth, their beliefs, overcoming obstacles, tenacity, resolve, commitment, etc. So I create these customized sessions for, for, my, for my clients. I work with professional athletes, CEOs, entrepreneurs, etc. Um, and then uh, there has to be some kind of a plan to follow. And I always like to work in phases. So phase one of what we want to accomplish over an agreed upon period of time is we're going to get this and this and this done. And all of it has to be based on your financial and non-financial abilities. But we're also working backwards, right, from a year backwards to now, two years backwards to a year, five years backwards to, I don't even do five years anymore. I usually won't go further than three because things are changing so For much. Sure. Um, so, so the question now becomes is what does it look like to scale? Right? So what does it look like to scale? So if you're working backwards from a billion dollars, it's very, very different than working backwards from a million dollars. Yeah. Right? And most people can't think at a billion dollars because there's not a lot of mentors who've been there or they know how to think at that level. Um, but you have to create phases so people can see themselves ahead of where they are now. So in phase one, we're going to help you get to here. In phase two, we're going to help you get to here. In phase three, you're going to help you get to there. So you want to always have them, you know, six to 12 months ahead of where they are. They have to focus on the now. I get it. But you have to train their brain for being ahead of where they are right now because to scale, okay, requires um, uh, uh, um, processes, systems that, that need time either to be developed or to implement. So you can't, you can't say, well, okay, what we need to do today is this. Well, you might need 90 days to implement that. So you're not going to be ahead of what you need. And whether it's manufacturing, you talked about Damon John and manufacturing, right? They're, they're like seasons ahead, mm -hmm. right? So they're thinking, you know, um, um, Jim Rohn said, he says, in summer, you have to be thinking winter. In winter, you have to be thinking summer, sure. right? But as an, as an entrepreneur... Um, you have to be think about, you know, uh, whether it's the market, the financing, the economy, um, what's going on in the world as it might affect you. So you're always um, have got a, a bit of a, um, a focus on the future um, while you're focusing on the implementation day to day, week by week, month by month. Is that an answer to absolutely. your question? Yeah, absolutely. All right. On the charity side, why do you think that people whether that's for themselves or for their companies, should get involved in some type of philanthropy. So if we want to go to, um, you know, biblical times and, and tithing, right? Mm -hmm. It was, came, came out of religion, right? And, uh, and we got conditioned into giving. I believe that since we're all, uh, I'll give you a couple different answers, where we're, we're all um, energy, we're all entangled, we're all connected, and... Um, and if we truly believe that there's an abundance, then there's more than enough for all of us. And people live in one of four planes of, of reality. There's scarcity, there's not enough. There's security, there's just enough. There's success, there's more than enough, but there's significance, there's more than enough for all of us all the time. And so I choose to live, and I know you do as well, from a place of abundance that there's more than enough. And uh, if you believe in the law of attraction, then whatever you put out there must return back. But I don't think 
you know, that's a good way of thinking about charity because that's almost like trading with the universe, <laughs> right? It's kind of like, I'll give because I'm going to receive. That's not giving. That's that's trading, mm -hmm. right? It's kind of like, I'll do this for you, but if you do this for me, that's mm -hmm. transactional. I don't want to be transactional with, I don't want you, God, with, uh, with the universe, with the intelligence. Um, so I believe mm -hmm. that, uh, A, giving makes you feel amazing, mm -hmm. part one. Giving helps a, a person, a cause, um, um, uh, 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 something of importance to you. And even if it's not of importance to you, if you can help somebody, you know, that has something that's important to them, um, it's an act of love, right? It's an act of kindness. It's an act of caring. And we know from science that when, when I... Uh, act in a space of love, when I give kindness, um, then there's a lot of kindness that comes to me. Uh, so I think, I think that everybody should have something, you know, something that they, um, feel is, um, uh, makes them feel good and has an impact outside of the return just for them. Hmm. So, uh, we, you know, as a company, I know you do as well. We give a percentage of all of our gross revenues to different charities. And my wife and I and kids give to charities as well that have a meaning to us. So I think there's um, there's there's 10 different reasons why uh, I think you should get involved. All right, this is the last question and I've never gotten the same answer and I have a feeling we're not gonna get the same answer here. John Asraf, 100 years from now, 150 years from now when it's time you know, you might have robotic kidneys by then. So let's say hundreds of years from now, and it's time you finally pass away. And you've already done billions of dollars in sales, and you continue to do tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars over the course of your career. How much, what percentage do you leave to the children? To my kids? Mm -hmm. So I've set up my kids' trust. So they at um, 35, 40, and 45, they get a third, a third, a third of what I have for them in their trust. Um, there is a, a group that I've put together as the trustees of their estate, my estate, but also uh, the money for them. Um, and uh, first and foremost, uh, my, my kids have never gotten a lot other than experiences, hmm. just experiences. My kids, if you tell my, ask my kids, do you get a lot of money from your dad or mom? And they go, no, not. My kids, number one, have never asked for any money since they came back home from college because hmm. they're self-sufficient and they're debt-free and they have investments. Nice. Part one. Part two is um, I don't believe that giving kids money, especially at a young age, is a smart thing to do because if you don't understand how to earn it, you don't understand how to value it. Hmm. Now, as they're older, and now I know they have the values that we've instilled in them. We know that they are charitable, they're philanthropists, they give, they're not st crazy stupid spending their money, you know, on whatever might be crazy. Uh, now I wanna leave them money to be able to to invest, to be able to live good lifestyles, to be great contributors to, to mankind uh, and to the world and to the causes that we so desperately need right now, whether it's our climate, whether it's our waters, whether it's food, whatever it is, uh, I believe uh, we give them. Um, my, Marie and I have already agreed, my wife, that we will give our kids 25% of our net assets 75% we give to the charities of our choices, which we already have. Where can people find you across social media? On Instagram, like Dan, um, johnassraf.com, my website. Um, I'm on YouTube. I'm on uh, Facebook. I'm, I'm all over social media. Any in particular books or things they should watch? Um, my newest book, Inner Size, The New Science to Unlock Your Brain's Hidden Power, is seriously an absolute must for anybody who really wants to use more of their $100 billion brain to strengthen your mind and get rid of the mental and emotional obstacles and any limitations. Must read. If you're an entrepreneur, read The Answer, How to Grow Any Business, Achieve Financial Freedom, and Achieve and, and Live an Extraordinary Life, New York Times bestsellers. Um, Stephen Covey loved that book. Um, if you want to set and achieve goals, read my book, Having It All, which was my first New York Times bestselling book. I appreciate you being here. Everyone listening at home or in your car or in the gym, please make sure to listen to a podcast like this. Check out John Asraf across social media. I've been following him for years. Even though we're close friends, I still listen to everything he's talking about. So check him out across social media. Check out the books. Go visit us at themoneymondays.com. Share with your friends, and we will see you guys next Monday. Mm -hmm.